Amen. Okay, someone would, would someone like to read Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 5? I want you guys to understand that when you when you have a, a full time minister of the gospel, Jim's been one for seventy years. I suspect Charles has probably been one for about that amount of time. I'm working on thirty plus. We have the inclination, we've got the desire to sit here and pull apart these texts. We probably have spent some of our funds on buying some pretty good reference works so that definitions can be determined. I could, I don't do it in lessons because it's, it's not necessarily helpful, but we could ascertain exactly where works is the, the specific definition. I could tell you what the definition was in classical Greek. I could tell you what it is right in Koine Greek in this type of Greek. I could tell you what it is in modern Greek, which was, was about from the 500s. A.D. onward, we could do all of that. We could dissect it completely. We could surgically take it all apart. And almost none of that is necessary. There are times when it's necessary. But most of the time, and I'm heavily, heavily emphasizing that you, talking to someone that you know with an English Bible, there's one thing you have to pay attention to. And it is not in-depth definitions of a language that died 1,500 years ago. What is it? The context. The context. Take virtually any English version that you want. There are some better than others. Absolutely. I've just started using one in my personal study that is touted to be the most accurate of all of them which is saying something if it goes if it's more accurate than the American standard and the and the new American standard that'll be saying something but but my initial reaction is it is incredibly literal which means in the English it reads very very strange so that if it reads strangely in the English ironically it's probably a much better translation but anyway someone has asked about a sermon on about Bible versions. I can't do it in one, but I can do it in two. It will be technical. It might be a bit boring. But we will go through that because there is a lot that comes out all of the time. And a lot that you might be interested in. And it's my job to take you to make you mildly interested in it. So we'll, we may do that in the, in the future. But all of it mostly rides. And when I say most, I mean the vast majority of it. Rides on understanding context. So chapter 2, we talked about chapter 2 last week. Chapter 2 was, well, chapter 1. Chapter 1, Paul was telling who that they needed saving. The Gentiles. In chapter 2, which is what we studied last time, who needed saving? The Jews. Okay, why? Did, okay, chapter 3, who needs saving? Everyone. Now in chapter 4, though, we swing back to the Jews. In chapter 4, we're going to swing back to the Jews. Why? Why? The context is saying that in chapter 2, for example, in chapter 2, why did the Jews need saving? Because they couldn't perfectly keep the law of Moses. However, how did they feel? From the standpoint of a Jew in the first century, how did they feel? They felt great. Because they had the law. And as long as we had the law, we're what? We're good. Paul said what? 
This was part of chapter 2 last week. What did Paul say? You've got the law, but you're not keeping it. You're not following it. There are still moral issues that you're not living up to that law says. So you are equally just as bad as the Gentiles. So now after having established the fact that the Gentiles need saving, the Jews need saving, everyone needs saving, he's now going to tell what? How you do that. And in order to tell them how they do that, he comes up with a, an example. Who is the example in Romans chapter 4? Abraham was. And he's able to give Abraham as such a great example because he ties in with, on the screen, he ties in with who? He ties in with the Jews. Okay. He ties in with the Jews. So what is the point in, our, in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 4? What are you getting? What are you understanding is the point about Abraham. You don't, we don't have to, you don't have to split it all in, in all different ways, but just initially as we read through those first four, five verses, what is the point that you're getting about Abraham? Okay, so Abraham, not only was Abraham before the law, how far before the law was Abraham? Have you ever thought about this? How far? So when was the law, when did when the children of Israel come out of Egyptian captive? Not that any of this is necessarily important. However, we all of us need to know Bible timeline. We need to know our we need to understand how time passes in the Old Testament. So when did the children of Israel come out of Egyptian captivity. A round number is great. Okay. It came, they came out at about what time? I'll come back to Charles, but they came out about what time? About 1,500 years before, before Jesus Christ. Now, when did Abraham live? About 500 years before that. About 500 years before that. When I, when I used to teach the young boys, and I, I had the Old Testament, Jim had the New Testament, I had, I had one class period where we talked about all the chronological markers in the Old Testament. And there's, a, there's a few of them. And piecing it together, you know, Abraham was likely born around 1975 B.C. So Abraham was 500 years before the law. So no one on the face of the earth at that moment in time with all of man's finite capabilities could have ever envisioned what coming? A law coming. I mean, no one was going to envision that. But yet, what could Abraham do? In verse 2, he could be justified by works. Justified by works. If Abraham was justified by works, he would what? He'd have something to boast about. But not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Where does that come from, by the way? That quote. Yeah, and you guys with, with good Bibles will I mean, know it immediately. Comes from... Genesis 15. So the timeline in Abraham's life. We know about Abraham, and I'm going, to, I'm going to cut the corner just a little bit. We know about Abraham from Genesis chapter 12. Not really. It's really 10 and 11. But from Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis chapter 25. In those chapters, in chapter 12, what happens to Abraham? Again, just laying out basic Old Testament chronology. In Genesis 12, what happens to Abraham? He's, he comes out of Ur to Haran. Then God says, I want you to go into Canaan. And in chapter 12, He gives him how many promises? Three promises. Those three promises are going to be reiterated three more times. So there will be a total of four times times the promise is given to Abraham. 
Now Isaac and Jacob both get it too, but they only get it once a piece. Abraham gets it four times. In Genesis 15, it's the second time. Why repeat it the second time? Why repeat it in Genesis 15? What happens around in there that makes them kind of that makes them kind of think about it? In Genesis 15, what happens? Now after these things, which was chapter 14, God comes and says, Do not be afraid, Abram. That's Genesis 15 verse 1. I am your shield and your great reward. Abraham had just had to go and do what in Genesis chapter 14? He had to go fight a battle. Had to go fight a battle. This is where we meet Melchizedek. Had to go fight a battle. Well, you can imagine coming home after having fight, fought a battle, Abraham thinks, man, I just barely what? I just barely made it. I just barely got back. You know, because you think about going into a battle and someone swinging a sword at you and you're literally an inch from that. You know, you come back and you think, boy, I barely, just barely made it. And here's God promising me that I'm going to have an heir and I almost bought the farm. So what does God do in Genesis 15? He reminds him of the promise. Okay, reminds him of the promise. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing that I go childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? So Abraham's kind of, sort of, maybe, possibly thinking about what? Maybe. Maybe sort of, kind of, possibly thinking that God's going to give him an heir, but it's not what most people would think. Okay, Lord, I'll, I'll have an heir, but who will it come through? It'll come through who? It'll come through Eliezer. It'll, it'll come through Eliezer. But no, what does God say? Because again, in verse 3, you've given me all offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my, is my heir. But the word of the Lord comes to him and says, what? He will not be your heir. It's going to be someone from your own body. And Abraham's thinking, what? Not yet. But what does Abraham think? Because this is important. In, in 5 and 6, God says, no, it will be someone from your own body. And Abraham thinks what? Okay. Okay, Lord. Okay. This is going to happen. So he believed God and what? It was counted to him for righteousness. Okay, so let's fast forward now. Because in chapter 16, who comes along, Charles? Ishmael. And was Ishmael born of Abraham, Abraham's own body? Yes. And so, particularly Sarah thinks what? This is what? Here it is. This is the answer. But it wasn't what? It wasn't. So God in chapter 17 does what? He makes a sign with Abraham. And he reiterates the promise again the third time in chapter 17. And with that reiteration comes the promise, comes the sign, I'm sorry, comes the sign of what? Famous chapter. 17, uh, circumcision. I always told the young boys that in the Old Testament when you're dealing with 969 chapters, I think, it can sometimes be difficult to remember the book chapter and verse. Easier in the New Testament because you're dealing with less than a third of the verses. But you need to remember book and chapter. So when I tell you circumcision, you tell me Genesis 17. When I tell you Ishmael, you tell me Genesis 16. When I, when I tell you Joseph, you say Genesis 37. That's where it all begins. So Genesis 17 is a, is a landmark place in the Old Testament because that's where the... 
the sign of circumcision is given. Okay, so Abraham knows it's not going to be Ishmael, it is going to be who? Isaac. He's given a sign, his name is changed. It is what? Official. It is official. Not going to be Eliezer, not going to be Ishmael. It will indeed be Isaac. We move on ahead to Genesis 22. The last promise that's made. Everything is, a lo- is all well. Scholars guesstimate that Isaac is somewhere in his mid-teens. Maybe 20. Not, nor do we just don't know. And now all of a sudden God says what? Now you've got to sacrifice him. Now you've got to sacrifice him. And there are multiple options that Abraham could have thought that could have run through his mind. Abraham could have thought that, okay, if I sacrifice him, then God can... I mean, He gave me one. God can what? God can just give me another one. But he also could think about another option, a more implausible option. But however, it was the option that Abraham went with. He's raising the knife. And the language, you you talk about preachers going with their books and their study. The language of Hebrews 11 unequivocally says that when that knife was raised, he was ready to what? The specific structure of the original language says that Abraham wasn't doing it for play. He was ready to kill him. Because why? Because he believed that God could raise him from the dead. He believed that God could bring him back to life. Here was Abraham not working according to what? The old law, but working according to what? His faith. His faith. And when you get in Hebrews chapter 11, Abraham was a man of faith. And so what did he have to do? By faith. Two big things that the Hebrew writer brings out. There's a lot of things in in Abraham's life where he had to work and live by faith. Although, he was not, he was not what? He was not perfect. He was a patriarch. He He was the, and I think you could make the argument, that he was the preeminent character in the Old Testament, that is a very, very hard statement to make because you've got a lot of good choices. You've got who else? Moses. Who else have you got? David. It's a hard, it, it's a hard statement to make. But you can make a good case. He is the most preeminent person in the Old Testament. And yet, he was not perfect. He did, he did sin. But he wasn't a Jew and he didn't live his life according to the law of Moses. Because again, no one had even dreamed of it yet. 500 years away. But he could live his life by what? Faith. Hebrews chapter 11. Two instances. He left his homeland and he went to the land of Canaan by faith. The second one we just talked about. Genesis chapter 22. Abraham was offered Isaac. And this is what's interesting. The, The language in Hebrews chapter 11, if you'll notice, it said... He did what to Isaac? By faith, Abraham offered Isaac. Now what would the English language tell you about that statement? Had you not known anything in Genesis 22? It was a done deal. He killed him. The specific way that the Hebrew writer put it is that he went through with it. Why do it? Why misrepresent it? I used a loaded term, by the way. Why misrepresent it? In his mind, the knife was going to come down. And that's the way the Hebrew writer wrote it. Because what does that truly manifest? Faith in God. And faith in His promises. It, it's just, it's, it's a, it, it, it really is. The, the life of Abraham is magnificent in a lot of different ways. We've only been able to touch on it in a few minutes here. But the life of Abraham is a magnificent life for a lot of different ways. But 
more to our more to our point this morning, works versus works. Works versus works. I would never have to even bring this up were it not for another passage. And what passage is that? You will never have to fool with this if this one passage had never been written. James chapter 2. James chapter 2. In Romans 4, what are the works that are being discussed? The works of the law. Abraham was justified by his faith. The Jews of that day had the law. They'd had it for 1,500 years. But Abraham was still 500 years away from his from his from his law that his progenitors would then have but Abraham could be justified by his faith now the point that kind of telescoping on beyond this which isn't part of specifically the lesson is that everyone can have salvation by what faith not by faith in the old law but faith in what was promised to lo and behold was promised to who Abraham, because one of those three promises was the promise of what? In your seed shall all of the nations of the earth be blessed. What did that mean? Very cryptic when it was given, but not so cryptic once you get to the New Testament. In two, again, two incredible places, Acts chapter 3, 22 through 25, and then Genesis chapter 3, and Galatians chapter 3 and verse 15 explains what that meant. That seed that was going to bless all of humanity was who? Christ. And the Jew could have their, their salvation by their faith in Christ. Just like Abraham could have his salvation, as it were, by his faith in what? In what God said. In what God said. So James... I say throws a wrench in it. It doesn't throw a wrench in it for, I think, proper understanding of the Word of God, but it does throw a wrench in other people's understanding. Because what will people tell you? You can't be saved by what? Works. You can't be saved by works. So what is a work? Well, I'll tell you one thing that's a work. What is a work? What is a work? One thing I can sure tell you is a work that you're going to hear. Baptism is a work. So if you can't be saved by works, you can't be saved by what? Baptism. And this is where the real problem lies. So once you kind of once you get through it all, the real problem lies in the fact that baptism is a work and you can't be saved by works. Speaking as someone that you're going to be speaking with, that's the real crux of the issue. Baptism's a work. You can't be saved by works. Okay, so James chapter 2. What is the context of James chapter 2? Now that's James chapter 2, so it's like the whole thing. So where, do, where does it get started? In 2, verse 1. How does it start? Well, what's the point of it? Starting in two. Yes, respecting person persons or in partiality. So what you can't do what? You can't show favoritism. Right. You can't show judgment because the gospel is for all. The gospel is for all. And then you get to verse five. God has chosen the poor of the world to be the ones who are rich in faith. In verse 8, you need to fulfill the royal law. And again, what does that royal law say? Loving your neighbor as yourself. Is that Old Testament? Yes. Here's the kicker though. Is that New Testament? Yes. How is it New Testament? Because Jesus quoted the Old Testament when He was doing New Testament teaching. So is it the Old Testament or the New Testament? Yes, it is. 
So he says, you love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. And you're convicted by the law as transgressors. Which law? Kind of, really, kind of both. So he says in verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is what? Guilty of it. So don't commit adultery. Do not murder. Old law or new law? Again, kind of, kind of both. Twelve. So speak and so do is those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Old Testament or new? Oh no, that's new. That's new. Live so as you going to be judged by what? The law of liberty. So live is a big word. And live means that you've got to do stuff because that's what you do in living. Living is composed of doing stuff. So you've got to live according to the perfect law of liberty. So remember, living means doing stuff. And doing stuff means works. So we get started in 14. What does it profit if someone says that he has faith but he doesn't have works? That's not going to what? That's not going to save him. Not going to help him. In verse 18, I, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that there's a God and you do well. Lots and lots of people believe in God. But the, the problem is in verse 19, what? Right. What's the old expression? I guess it's an old expression. Uh, I'd have to check TikTok because that is the arbiter of all things that were created yesterday. But all of us old fogies would say that finding people who believe in God are a dime a dozen. A dime a dozen. So dime a dozen, apparently, that in verse 19, you can even find what? Demons who believe. So the point is in verse 20, but do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? What kind of works? What kind of works? Righteous works. God's work. The kind of works that the law of blank, liberty, tells you to do. So he says, he brings up now in verse 21, who are we back to? Abraham. And Abraham, our father, was justified by works. But Paul just said, he just wrote when we started this class, he wasn't justified by... Now, it was worded oddly, but the point was, he wasn't justified by what? Works. So in four, he wasn't justified by works. In two, he's justified by works. How do you explain it? What did I tell you? You don't need big dictionaries. All you need is what? All you need is the context. In four, what was the context? The works of the law. In two, what's the context? Just, just acting, just living, just walking as a Christian. Walking according to the law of liberty. Abraham had to do what? In, according to James 2. Yeah. He, he had to do what God said. He had to live it. He had to walk it. He had to do it. And you get to 21, he was justified by works when he did what? When he offered Isaac. So faith worked together with his works. So when God told him to do something, his faith said you need to do that. And so he did it, and that did what to him? That justified him. In verse 20, the end of it, and by works faith was made Perfect. What does being made perfect mean? Complete. So let's kind of delve into that. Because there, there is a, I, I think a, a narrow point, yet an important point that needs to be brought up. What does it mean that works, that faith is made perfect? So don't tell me complete because we already know that. What does it mean? What's the very fine point of what does that mean? Okay, can mean acceptable. If you think about it this way, everything that God imagined with people having faith and then people doing what He wants, when you combine those faith along with what God wants you to do, then those two together are all of a sudden what? 
the New King James Version uses the word perfect. But what else is it? It is complete. It is, what, what else did someone say? It's righteous in the sight of God. It's acceptable in the sight of God. You could also say that your life is everything that God what? Expects it to be. When you have faith and you use that faith and you go out and you do good works, your life is what? Everything that's complete. Everything that God wanted it to be, that's what your life is. So what about when you divert and you sin? What do you do? Give up? You could. I mean, people do it. But what could you also do? You could change and just be what you're supposed to be. And then what will happen to you? Then you're, made, then you're forgiven. Again, then you're, then you're made perfect. But that, that wasn't... And let's keep looking real quick. Verse 23, And the Scripture was fulfilled, which as Abraham believed God, it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called what? The friend of God. Do you know how many people are called the friend of God in Scripture? Do you know how many people are called the friend of God in Scripture? One that I know of. <laughs> and it's just Abraham. Daniel had a, had a all, for all the ladies in the class, Daniel was called something, and he's the only one that's called it. He was called Beloved. Beloved. He's the only person except, of course, from who? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He's the only unquestioned mortal person ever called Beloved. Abraham's the only one called the friend of God. Because why? Because his faith let him do something. So you see that man is justified by works and not by faith only. And then just one other instance in verse 25. Who else is brought up? She's not developed as much. But who else is brought up? Rahab. Well, Rahab had to do what? She had to believe with, with what the spies said, which was, what did the spies say? That we're coming, and you'd better what? You know, give up. So she didn't want to die, and she hid them. Now, yes, in part of that was what? Yes, but in part of her hiding the spies included her doing what to her own countrymen? Her deceiving them. But the point, again, it's a very finely tuned point that James wants to make is here's another person who had faith and had to do what? Had to work according to it. So we end with, are you a Jew or a Gentile? Maybe we'll just talk about that just for a minute next time. And then we'll move on to Romans chapter 7, verses 14 through 24. And trying to decipher all of that heard a lot of misgivings about Romans 7 and you probably have too. So we'll look forward to that next time.